Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the New Art School and Design the Ducks podcast. Our guest today is Julia Goga Cook. Welcome, Julia. Thank you, Lefteris, for having me. Oh, it's great, great for, you, for us to be here. Uh, tell us about you and your work. Well, um, I run a design academy, which is a design thinking and entrepreneurship academy. And I also teach at two universities, at Loughborough University, London, and also at Central St. Martin's University of Arts, again in London. Brilliant. So uh, would you like to tell us a bit more about, about that? And uh... Sure. Um, my speciality, you know, it, it, within the big world of design is design thinking. And this is about, you know, how can we use the designer's tools and the designer's mindset in order to solve problems? And this could be any type of problems, really. Problems that we have in life, problems that we have at work. Um, and this is specifically when we are addressing problems that are complex, problems that have got many unknowns, a lot of ambiguity, they have got a lot of stakeholders and there is not just one solution that solves them. Sometimes, you know, in the design language, we use the term wicked problems, which means problems that probably don't have a solution. You know, when we're talking about unemployment, poverty, all these, you know, big societal problem, you need to have lots and lots of solutions, very often, very locally based, before you can see if you can scale some of them. So. This is where the design thinking as an approach, but also as a mindset, comes as a very good discipline and very good body of methods um, and tools that can help people find solutions. So this is where my field is, basically. Very good. So tell us, tell us where you are applying these, uh, the, pro the projects that you're applying design thinking. Well, I would say a lot of teaching, um, and this is primarily um, teaching students who are uh, in the master's degree, but also teaching people in companies how they can adopt this type of mindset and how they can adopt the design thinking process in order to innovate and this is in order to innovate in a broad range of things you know how to innovate in products in services how to innovate in experiences but also how to innovate in the ways of working so you can use design thinking as a process for innovation um, and it gives really great great benefits brilliant any specific projects that come to mind that you're working on uh, recently uh, probably, you know, I, I could talk about the projects um, that El Tabo University we have been doing um, with different, you know, we call it collaborative project, but also even within the subject of design thinking, the way how we do it is design doing rather than design thinking as such, where we have a brief from clients and these can be um, government organizations, can be corporates, can be um, charities that have got a challenge which is pretty complex and then we get a bunch of students to work together with them over a period of five weeks or over a period of ten weeks and by doing that they learn the methods they learn the tools and they apply them there and then and in a very collaborative way and this is very mixed disciplines this would be students from different types of disciplines coming together in these projects to solve the problems um same thing you know other other um i would say things which have really excited me is working with companies where we, you work with different teams depending on what they do. And you know, I've worked with different industries, more than 100 companies now. Uh, and normally I don't talk about the, the companies as such, but it's like, how can they develop the design capability as a human-centric approach to innovation? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Yeah. 
Okay. Yes. So, so uh, tell us about your journey into education. How did you get into education? Gosh, I started in education. You know, I knew from when I was very little that I wanted to become a teacher. Uh, my brother often says, because I'm very bossy, and she says she wanted to boss around everybody. And this was the time when the teachers could bossy people around. We're talking, you know, last century now. Um, but yes, I became a teacher and I started in linguistics. And that's where I had my PhD in acoustic phonetics, um, comparing sounds of languages in order to help teachers then teach those sounds in the right way. Um, I remember at the time, um, this was made possibly this type of comparison and these experiments were possible at the MIT and also at Stockholm University. And I was so excited. You know, today we think nothing about when we see the sound on the screen and then edit them, yeah? But at that time, being able to see the sound or being able to type in a computer and then you can you could hear that as a spoken word was revolutionary. So that's what excited me. So I, I, I would say that I have loved innovation and doing new things, being the first to adopt those things, you know, from, from the very start, but without calling it that, you know, without calling it innovation as such. I grew up in Albania and that was under communism. And when communism fell and the BBC here in UK decided to broadcast uh, to Albania, Kosovo, Macedonia, the Balkans, I was recruited to come from Albania to London to start with the broadcasts. So I made a shift from a teacher, lecturer, to a journalist. That was a very, very big shift in terms of a big change, you know, a big change in profession, but also a big change in culture, you know, moving from Albania, which had just come out of communism. And I would say, you know, we were still queuing at two in the night for a kilo of meat and then coming to a country where I could put something in the wall outside in the street and get money out. So the cultural shock was big. Uh, but also very exciting, and I, and I remember it was a period of a lot of learning. You know, the BBC trains its own journalists, <laughs> so we had intensive training, and then got thrown into the deep end and started broadcasting. And so, yeah, I spent about 16 years with the BBC in various roles, and this is how you go, you know, you are a broadcaster and then you become an editor, and in the end I was editing across radio, television, and online, and also the 44 languages that the BBC broadcast to the world. And it was a very, very exciting period. You know, I, I was very lucky to, a lot of learning. Um, I would say, you know, it, it was constantly learning about the world and constantly learning about different cultures and collaborating with people that were so, from so many different backgrounds and seeing the world from their perspectives. But also, you know, the other things when I was able to see my country from outside, from a different perspective, that also became very powerful. Um, well, you know, I, had a, I, I was very lucky to have an, an amazing career at the BBC. And then I decided, right, I want to have a gap year. So, you know, when I said to my boss that I wanted to leave, I want a gap year and said, at least you should say, I want to have a sabbatical, you know, at your age, it's not gap year. I said, well, you know, I've never had a gap year, so I might as well have one now. And this is how I got a gap year. At that time, uh, design thinking, we're talking 2008. And design thinking was something that had just come to be heard, you know, as a term. And I had no idea what that was. And I thought, well, I can find out. And Central St. Martins, in fact, was the first university here in UK to introduce innovation management via design thinking. So I became a day student, went into the MA to learn what is innovation management. You know, I had led innovation for many years at the BBC, many, many years. But had I learned anything theoretical about innovation? No. 
you know, you you know things like yeah, brainstorming and a few few things or read here, but having a process how to innovate and things like that, not really. So again, you know, it was a, a very a very exciting period for me going back to books rather than reading news which become old very quickly. You know, I was reading books and I found back that joy of learning at a deep level. And really that was awesome. But also the other thing is most of the students in my class were very young people. You know, at that time we had just started to talking about uh, Generation Y and, you know, they were just starting to, to, to come into the psyche of, of, of people. And being with Generation Y and seeing, you know, their way of thinking and their way of living and, you know, being part of them again, it was a different dimension in the learning to understand at a deeper level. And I, I cherish that here a lot. And as part of that school, I also had how to create enterprises, startups at London Business School. So it was a combined degree. Um, so I started creating my own startups. Uh, I didn't go back to the BBC after that. And yeah, so this is um, how I moved into a completely different stage in my life. Uh, again, a different profession, if you like. And uh, I became an entrepreneur. So it's like, oh my God, you know, would I have ever thought that I would become a startupper? <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. So there Brilliant. we are. Brilliant. So how can you, um, all your journey, um, what would you say to people that are interested about uh, a career in these, in these industries? Um, you know, today we have got such amazing possibilities to learn whatever we wish. Learn it from our own sofa, learn it from free, and learn it from the best that ever exists wherever in the world. You know, that opening up, that world of learning took me to the school learning the design thinking, took me to the MIT learning the entrepreneurship, the disciplined entrepreneurship, took me to Wharton fellows, you know, to become a member of the Wharton and how to, to get that leadership, you know, in, in the modern way, if you like. And you could do that all, something which, I would have dreamt before, but never thought would be possible. So I would say the possibilities are there. There are so many MOOCs and spokes and everything. Just get into it. You know, let your curiosity lead you what you want to learn. Sometimes it doesn't really have to be connected to what you do, but nothing is wasted. Everything comes together. You know, I can tell you an, a little example. When I was... Um, working as a teacher, I also became an interpreter, uh, a conference interpreter. This was when you do simultaneous interpretation and I was doing lots of conferences at the European Commission. When I became a journalist, I never thought that conference interpretation would be useful in, any, in anything really. And then time came, I don't know, you know, if you have been in England and you know the program Question Time, which is one of the flagship programs where you have an audience, a panel, and then uh, people from the audience ask the panel uh, questions. And usually it's a mixture of politicians and civil society all there. So this is, um, I was running the Albanian service at the World Service, and it was the time when the Kosovo War finished. And we had the town of Mitrovica, which was a separated town uh, where you had different communities of Serbs and Albanians still in very big animosity over there. So this is where we thought, well, why don't we do a question time in Kosovo where we can have in the panel both Serbian leaders, Albanian leaders, and international leaders that at the time were in charge in Kosovo, but also bring in the audience Serbs and Albanians. This was innovative. Nobody had done it before. It had, the risk was very big, but also the trust, I think, was very big you know, in what we had. And this is where, by having all that knowledge on conference interpretation, I was able to bring it there and say, right, what we can do is we give everybody headphones 
we have we bring three conference interpreters there and everybody can speak in their own language and everybody can hear it live as it goes along and it went seamless and it was so beautiful so all those things that people say now oh, can't do a different language how we go so that's why i'm saying you know nothing gets wasted whatever we learn comes back and you can use it in different types of forms so that that's really um yeah so go for learning. That's my, just my only thing. If I could be a student all my life, that's what I would give me joy. But, you know, I have to work as well and get some money. Do you find the experience of teaching, uh, distance teaching, do you find that uh, challenging? Uh, how, have you, how have you found it to, to, during these times? Well, um, I was doing virtual teaching for Centre St. Martins for some years now. Um, you know, these are, you know about the MOOCs, which is the massive open online courses, but then it is, you, we have the SPOCs, which is smaller groups with a, an instructor, with a tutor there, and it happens completely online. So I was doing this in terms of how to create startups for creative, business, for creative um, people. So I had been, I had been doing, I had been um developing that basically you know it, it, it was a new for me but during COVID when this request came it became a need that people could not come anymore face to face and you had to do that so this is when then I helped you know other businesses convert their face-to-face -face learnings into virtual instructor-led ones and at the Academy of Design Thinking that I run uh, we also converted all our products into virtual before we were not doing that. And I see that there are so many things that the virtual can give you. Still, it lacks the type of serendipity which is created when you bring people together. Because, you know, they are there, they have a coffee, they talk in the corridors, you know, they have the lunch together. It's a different dynamics. Nonetheless, it has not prevented us from carrying out uh, the learning that is needed, especially for critical skills that the businesses need to have, and they need to have them now. They're not going to wait until you know all this thing finishes. So it's it's been again, you know, um, a very interesting period to apply those things. And so at the at this time, you know, I'm applying what I was using at the university, applying now with businesses in the learning and development that the businesses are doing. So that, that's um, a very interesting conversion because teaching students is a different dynamics from teaching professionals in a company. But there are things you can learn from both milieus. Yeah. Tell us about your so academy. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Fantastic. Tell, tell us about your academy. Academy. Um, we are very focused academy a very boutique one, you know, it's like we are teaching design thinking primarily. And I'm sure, as you know, design thinking has evolved a lot during the years. And where we are now, you know, we have realized that really for people to go from a problem to a solution that they ship to the market, doesn't matter to them what methodology you're using. You need to give them the tools to get up to the end. And design thinking on its own, if it was as when it starts, it could not do that. And this is how we combined design thinking with lean, lean entrepreneurship, so that you can have all those things like how we use the business model canvas, but also how we brought tools that social innovation is using like theory of change and combine it with the design thinking. And at the same time, combine it with other methodologies that businesses are using this day, like agile, way of working and this is where you have a combination and that's why our our modules are pretty much at the intersection of all these so they are there to give people a mindset which puts people in the center to think about the human <laughs> to think about the people that they design solutions for to think about their problems, to empathize with them, and to want to make their life better in a responsible way. And this is you know, the, the part about the design thinking. 
Now, coming from journalism <laughs> for many years, you know, I've also um, included inside the design thinking the whole part about how do we tell a story? Because you go out, you do research design, you bring out the stories from the field, you share them, you talk about them. But also when you go out and you want to find the funding, you want to have people to support you with that innovation, you want the funders to finance you and all that, you need to be able to tell a story. And this is how we included the storytelling element quite a lot there. And now it has developed into sort of a, another department, if you like, where we teach storytelling for business success. And as data has become a big thing, you know, we, we all are living in the middle of data and most of us do not understand the spreadsheets. A big need has come, how do we communicate data in a way that is simple, understandable, and helps people to make decisions based on them. And this is where using storytelling structures to communicate data has become really powerful. And yeah, that's sort of the, the other bunch of uh, products that we bring together. Yeah. Fascinating. Gosh, I've spoken a lot. Shut me out there. Oh, please, this is, about, this is about you. Do you find that uh, limitations that could exist in additional structures at the university are freed up more in the academy? Because... Mm -hmm. uh, good question. Um, you know, usually it has to do still with technology. Well, we say technology is an enabler. Yeah, we are doing this podcast in Zoom. It's very easy, very doable. Picture is good, audio is good. Now, when you are, and, and this is how we are running our programs, we use a combination of Zoom. We combine it with Mural. I don't know if you know Mural as a tool, which allows you to visualize. So we still can split the teams into groups. They can work together as if they were in a big, you know, in a, in a big hall and they were in breakout rooms and create visualizations. Whereas if you are at the university, sometimes, you know, the, these tools are a lot more cumbersome. I mean, same thing, if you are in companies, the tools are more cumbersome because, you know, you have all the security, the safety issue, and you don't bring just every new tool that comes. Whereas when you are a academy that is, you know, in the size that we are, it's a lot easier to adopt the latest and get excited about it. So you have to understand. But I think the, the, the power of having a good pedagogy and a good design of the programs allows you to then convert that content and make use with whatever tools they have. You can't say to a company, ah, okay, you don't use Zoom, then I can't teach there. Makes no sense, no? So you have to find solutions and this is where the limitations become your constraints. And as you know, design loves constraints. So we find workarounds. How can we find solutions where this is the technology that we're going to use? And we have found lots of them, you know, kind of, yeah. So do you find some, some of the models you're using in the academy could benefit the universities? Do you have any advice for universities about making some changes based on what you're doing in the academy? I think it's the agility and the nimbleness, you know, because it's much easier when you are a small, a small setup, you can pivot very quickly. You can change, you can change direction. You know, it took us about 11 days in the academy to convert all our programs into virtual instructor-led. It takes a little bit more if you are a bigger setup, yeah? And the other thing is that how do you try them out? Again, because, you know, you created it, but you want to try them out so you can use it as a prototype and then keep pivoting. And that's why I say the nimbleness of it is, is you know, something that the big organizations try and learn from smaller organizations. But, you know, a very interesting thing what COVID-19 has brought to the realization for many people, for many big organizations where bureaucracy is such that it takes a long time for approvals, for decisions, for things to move along. They have seen that by having the pressure of having to create products for their clients now has 
made their speed go way beyond what they had thought before. So, you know, this is where that type of peak pressure on delivering the right thing that matters to the customers becomes a driver how to move faster. And I hope that for a lot of companies, you know, it will be a, a period of reflection where they say, what can we learn from this? You know, how agile and how nimble we became, how fast we moved, because a lot have moved fast and has been amazing to see. And how they take it with them when we move, you know, hopefully beyond COVID-19 period. Yeah. Fantastic. How can our viewers and listeners find more about you? Well, we've got an Academy of Design Thinking site. It's at uh, academyofdesignthinking.com. So very sort of easy. And I'm, I'm also very excited about one new thing that, you know, we were able to innovate during the COVID because we had a period when we were not delivering any courses at all. And we finished with a conversion and we were still had some time. And so what we do? No, we have been talking about micro learning for a long time now. It's nothing new in the concept. But a couple of people, you know, that we were in touch um, uh, over, you know, in, in the States, they created a platform of micro learning called ARIST. So, and this is, you know, where the learning becomes so micro that it can fit in a WhatsApp message. So we have now created our design thinking, you know, demystifying a crash course of design thinking totally as a mobile, as a, you know, it can be either in your mobile as a text or in your WhatsApp. A WhatsApp comes every day to your mobile at the time that you choose. And the whole module has got 15 lessons. So in 15 days, you can get all the basics of the design thinking in somewhat an interactive way as well. And that was, you know, again, a, a big excitement when we had to put it together because, you know, there were two different things there. The language, first of all, because it's a completely different register when you send something on a mobile for when you do a lecture. Yeah, the conversational language, you know, was a big thing. And the other one, you understand that there is a lot of bullshit around in what we say. And if we can take it all out, you can fit it in 1,200 characters that one lesson is. So that discipline uh, of really being brief, succinct, uh, was amazing. And again, you know, I want to say this is how the constraints became one of the partners in creating that because you couldn't go beyond 1,200 characters for that lesson. And you had to fit everything in it. And it was like, oh, okay, so let's, let's do it. So yeah, please. And at the moment we've, we have it as a free offer during the COVID. So please do, uh, I'll send you the link. Please you know, do enjoy it if you're curious and send us your thoughts so we can improve it. So now we are you know, creating other WhatsApp modules uh, for the other products that we have fantastic fantastic that's our newest offer any last advice you'd like to leave us with well um what i would like really to to pass on is that in a world where a lot of things is going to be done by robots you know automatizing lots of things that have to is going to happen but we still will need some human skills that will not be replaceable by machines. And this is what I'm talking here is about how can we create empathy? Uh, how do we bring humanity in, in, in our business? How do we collaborate? How do we create that environment where people can communicate in the right way? And these are skills that are going to be very, very important going forward. And just a couple of months ago, the MIT published a human skills metrics. There are about 24 skills in it. And all these, you know, like empathy, experimentation, collaboration, um, sense-making, they're, they're all there. And these are skills that everybody needs to have. So despite what disciplines people are, they will need to have, you know, in, in a T-shaped form, how to solve problems 
how to communicate, how to collaborate, how to lead. And that will create a more rounder development of oneself and being able to really be future-proofed, I would say. So get those skills as well, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Fantastic. You're very welcome, Lefteris. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here.